we'll just give it a couple, a minute or two. I see the numbers jumping up. Okay, I think we'll get started. Okay, welcome everyone um, to our Autism Speaks Community um, State Ohio well, um, Advocacy um, Update. And um, we're so glad you could join us. We, we know this is important to all of you. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for being here. Um, lots going on in the state of Ohio as well as nationally. And we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear um, from our experts in the field um, and uh, wanted to share with you what we are doing here at Autism Speaks. So um, again, welcome and um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Um, before we get started, just want to go over um, with you what our mission is at Autism Speaks and, um, and as I hate reading slides, but I think this is really important. Um, Autism Speaks is dedicated to promoting solutions across the spectrum and throughout the lifespan for the needs of individuals with autism and their families. We do this through advocacy and support, increasing understanding and acceptance of people with autism and advancing research into causes and better interventions for autism spectrum disorder and related conditions. We have mission objectives that we carry out through partnerships and collaborations and we are committed to through our five pillars. We, through increasing global understanding and acceptance of people with autism, being catalysts for life enhancing research breakthroughs, increasing early childhood screening and timely interventions, improving the transition to adulthood and ensuring access to reliable information and services throughout the lifespan. So before we get started into our program, just again, um, I'm Patty Gold, Executive Director of Autism Speaks for Ohio. And on this call, we have with us in the state of Ohio, um, Sherry Weifman, who is Director of Field Development for Central and Southern Ohio, located in Columbus. We also have Leslie Bloom, Manager of Field Development, excuse me, Field Development for nor the Northern and Western part of the state. She is housed in Cleveland. And Mackenzie Joan Snodgrass, who is our Senior Coordinator of Field Development, and she is housed in Cleveland, but works for, for the, uh, throughout the whole state, um, working on our special events. So without further ado, we are going to talk about what's happening in advocacy in the state of Ohio. Um, and I would like to introduce and thank Judith Ursity from, who is our Director of State Government, um, and she is going to um, uh, for advocacy and she's going to talk about what is going on in the state as well as um, talk a little bit about what's going on federally and what's happening um, in the autism world um, and uh, talk about um, also what's happening um, in the advocacy uh, world. So Judith. Let me unmute. <laughs> thank you Patty for the welcome and thank you Ohio friends for joining us today. I know everyone's probably very zoomed out right now. Um, and it's been such an interesting time, interesting, challenging. Um, I know it's been probably good to spend time with your families. Um, but it's also a time where our community specifically is struggling so much. Um, in fact, there might be a little background noise. I'm going to shut the door in just a few minutes. My son Jack is actually in the next room um, doing some remote um, learning and it's been very challenging for him. He's 16, he has autism, he has a severe intellectual disability, um, challenging behaviors. This has been a very difficult time for him. So my heart goes out to all of you, families, self-advocates, providers, 
um, we're living this with you and we wanted to connect with you and let you know that we've heard from so many of you over the last few weeks about what's happening in Ohio. We've heard about how educational services have just been halted. Um, day programs, there's been an issue there. Clinics that you normally access have been closed. Um, there's been a shift to telehealth for many of you, um, which for some folks that's better um, and for others it's awful. Um, there's a need for mental health supports, mental health supports for individuals on the spectrum, their siblings, their family members. Um, there's been a lack of connection to our communities, which for some people with autism, I was talking with some parents this morning who were talking about how their son with autism who's a teenager is happy. He doesn't have to go anywhere ever. Um, my son Jack wants to go to Outback Steakhouse every Saturday night for his wings. And so not going there, not seeing um, the Outback staff that he loves. Um, I know that might sound trivial, but for him, it's everything. Um, so that's been so hard and driving through and picking up the wings, they still taste really great. Um, they still have all those calories, but it's just not the same connection. Um, there's been disruption of employment opportunities, respite for families is not available. And we've heard some stories that are really challenging about people with autism wandering um, and their parents and their caregivers are doing the best they can, but providing that 24 seven safety support often is impossible. Respite is critical. Um, much needed routines are disruptive and routines are so important. Um, loss of income has been devastating for people with autism, for their family members, for providers who are trying to stay in business. And of course, challenging behaviors are something um, that many of us don't talk about all the time. We want to be respectful. Um, we want to make sure that people with autism have dignity and privacy, but we also want to really acknowledge um, the realities they face with regard to challenging behaviors. Um, we hear so much about it. Um, and then of course, trying to access healthcare in this new world has been very challenging. There's fear for people who fear their caregivers might not be able to be with them if they're hospitalized. Um, so those are things that we've heard about from you. And if there are other things that you're facing, we want to know about them so we can advocate effectively on the federal and the state level. Um, so please let us know. You can comment in the chat box. Everyone is muted right now, um, but you can comment in the chat box and we will respond and we'll stop for questions in between sections too, because we want um, to hear from you. And we apologize for the muting. It's just so that we can have a better connection and, and maintain that throughout the presentation. Um, you can um, also, um, with regard to your individual issues, contact our autism response team. They're wonderful human beings. They understand autism. Um, many of them are either involved with autism in their families or they're former providers. They're part of your community. You can contact them via email. You can contact them via phone. There's a number that's provided for those who speak Spanish. Um, so I think a lot of people don't realize that the autism response team is there, but we want you to know they're there. We want to encourage you to reach out to them right now. So we already heard from Patty. Hi, Patty. Thank you. Um, and her team, and they're doing an amazing job in Ohio. Um, I'm so excited that Dave is with us to provide a federal update. There's so much going on in DC, and I want to make sure that the autism community in Ohio understands what that means for you. I'm going to talk with you about things that are going on on the state level, and then we're going to have an amazing person from our community outreach department talk with you about resources that are available during this time of COVID-19 for you in your community. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Dave to talk with you about all the happenings in DC. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Judith. Uh, great to be with you all today. Um, as Judith mentioned, my name is Dave Sitkovsky. I'm a Senior Director for Policy and Federal Government Affairs here at Autism Speaks and based in uh, Washington, DC. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to just go over the federal advocacy, uh, the federal advocacy response from Autism Speaks and just in general, what has happened at the federal level in response to the uh, COVID epidemic, and, or pandemic, excuse me, and um, 
and then and talk about some of the priorities we've been advocating on. But um, you know, as always, we are really interested in hearing uh, from you all in terms of your experiences, your questions, and, and additional uh, areas that um, would be helpful to, to focus on. So um, Judith, if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, I wanted to just go over a broad overview of the federal action that's been taken since the outbreak of COVID in, in the United States. Um, and this will uh, most definitely not cover every last uh, detail of all of these um, bills that have passed. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna do my best to give you uh, an, an overview here of some uh, the, the important things that were included, but um, if, if there's something that you would like more information on um, or you have questions on, please don't hesitate to put um, questions in the Q&A box. So um, on March 6th, the first uh, bill was passed in response to uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, and uh, you'll notice here that uh, these bills, they all have their own names, but they're referred to as COVID-1, COVID-2, COVID-3, and that's just kind of the way that these um, bills have been uh, talked about in Washington as uh, basically in chronological order um, as uh, when they've passed. Uh, so the COVID-1 bill, the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations uh, legislation, uh, passed on March 6th, and this was really the first major action taken by Congress, um, providing uh, over $8 billion in emergency funding to help deal with the public health response to the outbreak. But, you know, of course, that was uh, just the first uh, action that needed to be taken, and, um, and Congress acted to um, address several other uh, uh, it, uh, acted to pass several other bills. So on March 18th, um, the COVID-2 bill, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, contained more provisions focused on um, individuals and, and families, including um, emergency paid sick and, and family leave um, for um, those working at employers with less than 500 employees. Um, and there's a, a substantial amount of detail regarding eligibility and, and criteria for that, but um, certainly an important uh, provision. Um, uh, there was tax credits provided, um, free COVID-19 testing were available. Of course, we know the challenges that have occurred with that, um, expanding food assistance, and then importantly, um, an increase in Medicaid funding with a 6.2% um, increase in the federal matching percentage that was given to Medicaid, which uh, which was uh, important at that time. Um, you know, with the understanding that uh, that neither of those first two bills really addressed the um, tremendous economic challenges uh, being faced by the country, by individuals and families, by businesses, uh, public health, et cetera, um, Congress passed the uh, COVID-3 bill, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which I'm sure all of you have heard about in one way or, or another. This was the really massive relief package of $2 trillion uh, of funding related to a whole host of things. So these are the $1,200 payments per individual, $500 um, for dependents under the age of 17, um, increasing the unemployment benefit amount by $600 weekly, hundreds of billions of dollars in public health response to state and local governments to address COVID-19. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a uh, forgivable loan program for uh, small businesses to retain employees and keep their businesses operating. Um, this was uh, $350 billion provided, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, billions of dollars for schools. Um, this is both at higher, the higher ed level and um, at uh, the elementary and secondary uh, ed level. And um, later on in the presentation, Judith is gonna talk about that, uh, the breakdown of that funding and or the, the, or I should say how that money was parceled out and, um, and what we've been doing in terms of our advocacy. And uh, finally, there was the extension of the uh, Money Follows the Person program through uh, November. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So, um, uh, after that bill passed on March 27th, there was still a um, an understanding that there would need to be more work done um, to address the really severe crisis that the country is in. Um, and so, since that time, there's been negotiation on a larger scale 
um, package of provisions to, um, to try to address some of the challenges that uh, Americans are facing. Um, those negotiations are, are still ongoing. However, Congress did act on April 24th to pass what's been called COVID 3.5, the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. And that was very narrow uh, legislation, hence the 0.5. Um, and it was really to replenish that small business assistance program, the Paycheck Protection Program that I mentioned before. Um, because of the huge demand for small businesses for uh, assistance and for the forgivable loans provided by that program, it ran out of money really quickly. And so Congress acted to both uh, replenish the funding that was available in, uh, in that program, as well as to provide some additional funding for the public health response in terms of uh, money to assist hospitals, healthcare providers, and uh, to provide for additional testing. Can you go to the next slide, please? So um, I, I wanted to just go over briefly just some of, some of the priorities that um, we have been working on, working directly with members of Congress and, um, and, and, and others to try to, uh, uh, to convey. And, and a lot of this is based on the conversations we've had with the community. Um, a lot of the things that uh, Judith uh, went over in, in the slide earlier, uh, trying to find ways through policy to try to help address some of those challenges. But certainly, um, you know, this isn't necessarily all inclusive, but um, a representation of, of some of the key priorities. So, you know, first, uh, you know, additional funding for home and community based services uh, to ensure for those who need it, that it is available, that there's the proper PPE um, uh, available for both um, those receiving HCBS services and for um, the caregivers and uh, to ensure a continuity of, of the workforce during this really challenging time. Um, additional funding to meet the educational needs of students uh, with autism. Um, so we know right now that the uh, distance learning that's being provided while uh, it, it, it's better than, than nothing in some circumstances is really not the same as the comprehensive learning opportunities that students have when they're physically in school. And so um, we're advocating both in terms of providing you know, the, the best and highest level of support for students right now during this time that we're experiencing di distance learning, but also advocating to ensure that uh, schools will have the resources to address any regression that's occurred during this time and to provide um, the services that are going to be needed for students uh, when they return to school. Um, protecting the rights of students under the Individual Disabilities Education Act and other laws. You know, these there are core protections provided for, uh, for students under IDEA. And um, we were concerned when we heard that there was um, some movement to try to roll those back um, during this crisis, uh, which we, we felt like could lead to the loss of services in the long term for uh, many, uh, many students who have you know, fought hard to, and, and their families who have fought hard to, to ensure that they're getting the comprehensive um, opportunities that, that are needed. And so, um, you know, fortunately, there hasn't been any waiver of um, any of the IDEA protections. There was a rumor that, um, uh, that this would occur um, we put out statements, uh, put out a statement, you know, advocating against that. Ultimately, what happened is the CARES Act, the uh, COVID-3 bill I mentioned earlier, included a requirement for Secretary DeVos to issue a report um, articulating any uh, additional waivers needed. Um, and on April 27th, she released a report um, indicating that she would not ask for any uh, waivers of the core protections of IDEA. So um, while we, we view that as, as a positive development, we also know that there are still huge challenges that need to be addressed. And so um, while in our opinion, a bad thing didn't happen, we, we still have, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, expanded access to telehealth services to um, ensure that healthcare needs are met um, is very important, something that we're continuing to advocate for and to ensure that uh, physicians as well, um, you know, I mean, this is a priority in general to try to ensure that physicians have um, the education and um, awareness to um, provide appropriate healthcare services for people on the autism spectrum, that they understand autism 
Um, and uh, it's, I think, the, the, the same, same idea here in terms of uh, providing telehealth services, which are you know, vastly different for a lot of individuals who are ex experiencing this, uh, this crisis. So um, that's, that's another area of support, a uh, 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 priority, I should say. During, uh, during this crisis. Um, eligibility for the $500 economic impact payments for dependents over age 17. So as I mentioned, the CARES Act provided $500 payments for dependents under age 17. Um, you know, we feel that this is an inequitable, uh, or an, uh, I should say this right, an inequitable uh, policy. And um, we've been advocating to ensure that um, those payments are made retroactively for dependents over age 17. Um, according caregivers of adults with disabilities, the same emergency paid sick and family uh, leave policy is according to caregivers of children. So uh, in, in the, um, the law that passed that provided emergency paid sick and family medical leave, there was uh, a lack of clarity in this. Um, there, there was an allowance for the caregivers of children whose schools have closed or, for, or, or whose daycare centers have closed um, during this time to uh, be eligible for emergency paid sick and family medical leave, but there wasn't clarity around uh, caregivers of adults whose uh, normal um, care was interrupted um, or, or normal services were interrupted because of uh, COVID. And so we advocated with the Department of Labor um, and fortunately, uh, it, as well as many other disability rights organizations. Um, and fortunately, uh, this, uh, this policy um, uh, went into effect allowing those caregivers to um, avail themselves of this. Um, and then preventing discrimination in treatment decisions and care allocations based on disability. Um, you know, we applauded the Office of Civil Rights for putting out, uh, the HHS Office of Civil Rights for putting out a statement um, and guidance to healthcare providers across the country to ensure that um, those types of decisions, uh, that there's no discrimination based on uh, an individual's disability. Um, we put out several statements as well regarding PPE and group homes and trying to ensure that there's the, the proper allocation of um, PPE to uh, those caregivers uh, to ensure um, uh, they have what they need to uh, care for those in group homes, in group home settings. And, and as well as um, putting on a statement regarding an issue of having um, caregivers in the hospital um, uh, with individuals with disabilities uh, during a, a hospital stay. Um, which are all posted on our website. Uh, the last thing I'll note is we've worked closely with Congressman Chris Smith and Congressman Mike Doyle, um, who are the co-chairs of the Congressional Autism Caucus. They've been in, the, in that role for several decades and uh, worked closely with them on uh, talking about these priorities and many other members of Congress. They've sent uh, letters to congressional leadership advocating for these priorities. In the last letter, um, they had 40 signatures on um, as well. All right, we can go to the next slide. So what's next? So uh, as I mentioned, there's still a desire to have, uh, from some, to have a, another package of, um, of, uh, of bills or, or another large bill, I should say, um, passed to address a whole host of different issues related to state and local governments having the funding they need, um, education, housing, um, there, there's uh, individual uh, and family economic relief. There's a whole host of other priorities. So um, on, on May 15th, the House of Representatives passed a bill called the HEROES Act, uh, which is a $3 trillion relief uh, bill. Um, this was, uh, I would say, an opening salvo in the um, negotiations uh, uh, related to what another package will look like. Um, and already the Senate has said that they're not going to be taking up this bill. So I would take um, all of that, uh, all of what I'm about to say about what's in the HEROES Act with, with that cautionary note in mind, that um, despite the fact that this, this, uh, this passed in the House, it doesn't guarantee that um, this is going to by any means be the, the final bill that is uh, signed into law. But that said, I did want to note a few um, uh, priorities that were included in the HEROES Act. So a substantial increase in funding for home and community-based services, um, $100 billion for education, uh, uh, the issue related to dependents over 17 receiving economic impact payments was addressed, 
uh, clarifying eligibility for paid sick and family medical leave uh, and family leave, excuse me, for caregivers of adults with disabilities and uh, $10 million for developmental disabilities activities. So all, all, uh, all of these things were um, you know, part and parcel of some of the priorities that we have. Um, but again, there's still uh, a lot of uh, discussion and negotiation that has to occur um, before anything is uh, passed into law. And so we're, we're not sure, to be honest, to be 100% honest with you, uh, uh, what the uh, path forward is from here. The, um, the Senate, uh, the ball is really in the Senate's court at this point to determine how they're going to move forward. And they haven't yet uh, put out a, a specific plan or, or a bill yet. And I know those negotiations will, will keep going. But anyway, I know I've gone on for a while. Um, and so I will uh, stop and uh, see if there's any questions that I can help answer. So Kelly Hedrick, who um, oversees our state government affairs and our grassroots advocacy at Autism Speaks is um, chatting with many of you. Thank you all for being here, for sharing your experiences. They're, they matter. Um, Kelly, do we have any questions that we need to address or have time to address right now before Dave has to go? Uh, no questions so far of a uh, federal nature. There may be some after you do the state update. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, well, then let's move on. Um, thank you so much, Dave. Very informative. And I know that's a lot of information that we're sharing with you, but we want you to know what's going on on the federal level and also things that we're hearing and ways that we're engaging with the state. Um, with regard to what we hear from our community, um, our folks generally access services in these buckets, healthcare, home and community-based services, HCBS, as we talk about a lot. And then many of you are utilize special education and early intervention services. And those are the things um, that the state is involved in with funding. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like for our community right now. Um, with regard to healthcare, a big portion of the autistic community utilizes Medicaid. Um, to go to the doctor, to um, just have regular well visits when you're sick, if you're hospitalized. Um, and so right now that's complicated because of all the limitations that have been placed upon us because of the pandemic. So CMS actually allowed for states to apply for a waiver um, for those Medicaid healthcare services that's meant to provide flexibility and relax some of the requirements um, so that it's just easier to access health care during this time. Um, so they've suspended temporarily um, prior authorization requirements um, and they're allowing some services to be provided in different settings. Um, they're modifying provider enrollment criteria. Um, they're modifying the pre-screening um, reviews and assessments that often are required. Um, they're waiving written consent on the person-centered plans that are used in Medicaid, um, and they're allowing some modification of timelines um, for initial and level of care determinations. Um, so those are just a few of the things that um, this 1135 waiver, which was approved for Ohio on April 22nd, allow. And if you really want to look at the details, um, and I know some of you are like, oh, I've had too many details, this is too much, but there are others of you who want to look at every single line. Um, there are links in this presentation, and you'll see at the bottom of this slide where you can find additional information about these 1135 emergency waivers that Ohio has been approved for. Um, we're going to send out the webinar after it's over to everyone who's participating, and I cannot thank you enough for taking time to engage today. So you'll have this and you can click through the links and really get down to the, the weeds if you want to. So that's coming your way afterwards. Um, another thing that affects healthcare is telehealth. And we're seeing that provided now more than we ever have before. And I know that in Ohio, it's been something that's been talked about, considered utilized for a while. Um, when the pandemic hit, on the federal level, CMS came out and said, we really want to encourage the use of telehealth for Medicaid services. And so in Ohio, um, that of course was implemented fairly quickly. And there is a lot of information online about that. And I know Medicaid providers 
have been implementing that over the last few weeks. Um, Governor DeWine also issue, issued an executive order in March um, for Medicaid providers that clarifies things too. And there's a link to the fancy language um, of the executive order if you want to take time and read that. Um, there are also for non-Medicaid, the private health insurance plans that many people have in Ohio, those that they get through their employer, um, they're encouraged to implement telehealth during this time as well. Um, so that um, notice was issued in early March and it just tells providers if you know, possible to utilize telehealth in the provision of services. And that applies to our community. Um, so it can apply to all sorts of things on the Medicaid side and the private health insurance side, um, behavioral health treatments that help some of our population, um, therapeutic services like speech, occupational and physical therapies, psychological, psychi psychiatric care. Um, and these are all the evidence-based interventions um, that have been proven to help um, that are medically necessary when prescribed by a licensed physician or licensed psychologist. Um, moving on quickly, um, I also want to talk with all of you about those home and community-based services, the waiver services um, that our families in Ohio use throughout their day to be in the community, to be part of the community. In Ohio, it's the individual options, level one, and the self waiver um, that have been modified a bit during this time. They have been modified just recently. Um, Ohio applied for what's called an Appendix K waiver, um, and I had never heard of Appendix K prior to the pandemic, but it's a tool that the federal Medicaid agency, CMS, provides during a time of national emergency like we're in, um, and it again allows flexibility, this time not on the healthcare side, but in that home and community-based services side, the waiver side. Um, so Appendix K was applied for by the state of Ohio and it was approved May 14th. And so in the waivers mentioned above um, on the slide, um, it allows for temporarily exceeding some of the service limitations that are typically on those waivers. Um, it expands settings where the services can be provided. Um, it even allows for family members, or caregivers um, to provide services in some situations. Um, and it modifies other provider qualifications. And in it, it's a balance of, of course, making sure services are still of good quality um, and that our waiver participants are safe and healthy, but also not restricted so much that they can't access services due to the pandemic. Um, so if you want to read specifics with this, again, there are links at the bottom. Um, about what was approved in Appendix K for waivers that you might be using. This was just approved May 14th, so the implementation is occurring right now, and these services and the flexibilities are going to be available during the time of the public health emergency. So this isn't permanent, um, it's just something that's available right now to try um, to ease the burden on providers, on autistic individuals, on their family members. Um, and also, there's a lot of information on the Department of Developmental Disabilities website. You can find that um, at the link as well. I know we're going through a lot very quickly, um, but if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with special education. It seems in the last few weeks that topic has really um, cycled up to the top. Um, if you think about how many people are reaching out and they're talking about just having the rug pulled out from under them, um, and not being able to access services that are usually provided um, via their individual education plans. And those services in normal times aren't always great. I mean, we'll be honest, but to not have anything at all um, has been extremely challenging for families. The Ohio Department of Education has posted a little bit of information on their website, but they really have not, it's sort of been non-committal um, publicly about their commitment to special education students. I did put links um, on the slide for your use if you want to look specifically about the messaging. Many of you probably already have reviewed this about what the Department of Education is saying about how special ed is provided during this time. 
Um, and also for those of you who use the John Peter Center, the Autism Scholarship, I know many families count on that and it's so important to them. There is specific information on the Department of Education website about how to access those services and if they can be delivered remotely when they are doing that. So if you need details about that, it's available to you at the link. Dave, when he was talking earlier about all the DC business and all the acts of Congress and so many details that um, seem often, you know, so far away. And it seems, sometimes to me, it seems like I hear about things that happen in DC, but they never seem to filter down to real life, you know, in our communities, with our families, um, with self-advocates, with providers. Um, in this case, the COVID-3 bill, the CARES Act, um, that Dave mentioned, um, there was a big chunk of money um, that was targeted in the Education Stabilization Fund. And so that money was allocated to individual states, and Ohio did get a specific number. Um, so they got $462 million from the CARES 3 Act for K through 12, and that is being um, allocated with a formula to the different um, school districts. Um, so that's kind of a formula that we can't touch, but that money is going and there is opportunity for the individual school districts to allocate towards special education needs um, for in that K-12 amount. There's money for post-secondary education, which is also critical to our population for those um, who are utilizing college and other opportunities. And then there's 103.9 million it's in the governor's discretionary fund. Um, it's also called peer funding, G-E-E-R. And governors are given discretion. They're supposed to use this money um, for educational um, purposes. And so we at Autism Speaks are reaching out to the state governors, to the state departments of education, to legislators, and asking that they use this governor's discretionary money for needs that have been identified to us through the community, through all of you. And so we've heard many times about the struggle for Wi-Fi, the struggle for equipment access during this time. There are families who have multiple individuals who are on the spectrum, um, and it's very difficult if they have one computer or they have Wi-Fi issues for them to participate in this remote learning model that's being provided. We're very worried about children right now that are in early intervention and what's happening with them. Are they able to access meaningful, meaningful early intervention supports to help them during this time? Um, and what is happening for them as they transition into special education for those who are turning three during this time? We wanna make sure that they get the services that are mandated federally to them. Um, also, there's a lot of talk right now, I'm sure many of you who are walking in the educational world are hearing so much about the services you're missing right now. You're not hearing it, you're living it. Um, and the services you're getting are quite different than what are identified on your IEP. Um, and many people focus on compensatory services that are going to be provided down the road. Um, that The advocacy around that is going to be critical. Um, in addition, we think at Autism Speaks that as soon as it's safe and appropriate, that services need to be provided in person now for students who need it in their individualized education plans. If you have members of your community who are able to be on the school property um, participating in sports activities, don't you think students who are on IEPs should be able to access the building if safety protocols are in place um, because I tell you what, waiting more weeks, waiting more months, um, and not accessing just the basic services identified on the individual education plans, it's not working. Um, our community is suffering, they're in crisis. And so there's really no reason um, if all these protections can be put in place um, that students who need the service in person can't access it. Um, if they so desire. For those who don't want to, who don't feel safe, um, they should have opportunity for them. Uh, but we're asking the Departments of Education and the governor um, to really think about providing in-person services as soon as possible, even in the summer.
Um, and then the other thing that we're contemplating a lot and talking with the governor about um, with regard to this discretionary fund, what's happening with those who are transitioning to adulthood right now? You're supposed to get services and supports as you transition. Um, and people that are autistic come in different levels, level one, level two, level three. Um, so there are different paths that people take. And transition services need to be provided for all those folks. And if they age out during the time of pandemic and have not received those transition services, what happens? Those services still need to be provided even though they've been aged out of the system. So we're trying to be innovative there and find solutions. Um, we've talked a lot, and I apologize for that. I hope this information has been helpful from an advocacy perspective. If you want to stay in touch with us, you can do so on Facebook, um, on Twitter, um, on Instagram, whatever your social media jam is, please um, follow us. And if you just don't do social media, you can also um, just stay up to date with information that's on our website, autismspeaks.org slash advocacy. There's a lot of bad information circulating out there about our advocacy priorities and about what we represent, represent as an organization. So I encourage you to get to know us. I think many of you already do um, know us very well. And for those who have questions and concerns, um, get to know us, join us in our advocacy efforts. Tell us more about what you need in the community. We want to hear from you and to represent the vast diverse needs of our community. So please do stay in touch. Um, Kelly, do we have any questions? I know I have talked and talked and talked. Yes, um, one question, Judith, about the flexibility around prior authorization, mm -hmm. if you know this, and if not, I told the individual we could um, try to follow up. So it's obviously clear for fee-for-service that there's some um, removal of temporary removal of prior authorization. Do you know if that's true for pharmacy as well, like epi -pin? I'm not positive, and I think that can get really drug specific too, depending on the type. So I think we need to look at more detail around that. That's a really good question that affects our community though, for sure. Great. Another one, are there funds available for intervention specialists to help get additional supplies for their classrooms and their jobs? Um, IT is a very expensive proposition with all the extra tools needed to serve the community and um, yeah, especially for younger, newer teachers who have chosen this field. It, it, it sounds like there's a struggle to have what they need. Um, so I know that's a broad question that has a lot of ifs, <laughs> you know, yeah. if the state uh, takes this money, but wanted to share that one. Yeah, so the K-12 funding as well as the discretionary funding that's come down from CARES 3, um, it's being allocated to the different school districts and then on that level, you know, they're making determinations at the county, the district level about how these funds are allocated. So it's a situation where I hate to continue to tell our community, oh, advocate here, and advocate there, and advocate state, federal, county, district. Um, but I would say as much as you are able, um, do get in touch and get involved in your local school um, there are opportunities to serve on, you know, school committees or even make public comments. Um, if you can just check your local school's website regularly too, they budget for these kind of things and that's kind of a, a local conversation that's so important. And for our community, if we don't speak up um, in our individual towns, our counties, our districts, um, no one's going to do it for us, unfortunately. Um, so as you are able, definitely see what your local school, school board is doing. Um, look at the budget, reach out to your special education director, your principals, um, and make sure they're aware of the needs. So. Yeah, yeah. So there, there could be, you know, there's certainly money flowing down. So yeah. hopefully some of it can get allocated that way. Yeah, uh, a positive so squeaky wheel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A somewhat related um, comment that's good to see early intervention intervention service providers have been asked to continue providing these services to children transitioning out of EI into preschool until schools are back on board and able to complete ERs and, and new IEPs. Um, this person, Kim's County, is small enough to be able to do that without too much difficulty. I know that each county is looking at 
that feasibility because of you know larger counties having that many more kids to serve. Right. Um, we have some folks who have shared some additional um, conferences, uh, webinars. So feel free to look at the chat if, in case you're interested in any of those. We have a question. In order to access Appendix K, do you need to have an ODDD waiver in place? Yes. Um, yeah. You do. And I know for those that might be waiting um, to be approved for a waiver, that's discouraging. And that's one of the things that's unfortunate. Um, there's only been a couple of states, Maryland's one, I cannot remember the other one, um, that actually added waiver slots as part of this process. Um, but Ohio is not added in the as part of this process. So. Yeah, and there's a part two to this. Um, the Appendix K form is, it, just, I'm just kind of responding. The Appendix K form is not used by individuals. It's used by the state to the federal government. So there's nothing that you would actively do to try to seek reimbursement as a, as a family member provider. But um, that's something that you can um, seek out through your, uh, the government agency through which you're receiving your waiver. Right, and I would say um, when you get a copy of the webinar, there is a link to the Appendix K form. You can look at it so you're familiar with what's been approved. And then there is contact information at the end of the app, the, that Appendix K. You kind of have to scroll through. There's a lot of pages. If you scroll through to the end, you'll see the email address, contact information of the agency folks who've approved and worked on this. Right. Uh, right there, was one, there was one other question that I will put a link to um, the Department of Labor uh, information in the chat box. It was about the size of employees for companies that um, that have the mandated uh, coverage of family leave, including individuals with disabilities. So I'll, I'll type that into the chat box for anybody. And I think we have a link in the slides as well. Yeah. So right. that catches us up for now. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you guys for the great questions and just the engagement today. It means so much. Um, right now, I'm gonna turn this over to an amazing person, Colleen, who um, has been involved in our autism community for a long, long time and wants to share with you information about what's available in your community right now. So Colleen. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm really proud of these webinars and, and how it's state-specific information as well as what we're doing federally around COVID-19. Um, I will tell you, I've been a part of Autism Speaks for the last five years as a full-time staff, but very involved as a volunteer prior to coming here. And the advocacy that we do is, is really, really important. And I will tell you that when COVID-19 um, started affecting our communities, the services and supports team, which is the mission area that my team falls under as outreach, really shifted gears pretty quickly to start helping to develop and also um, just gather different COVID information from other wonderful organizations. Um, you guys have a myriad of organizations and wonderful resources in Ohio. Ohio is one of my states that falls under my jurisdiction. I've visited there multiple times and I'm just so impressed with everything I've seen. Uh, so please, if you have great resources and I, I recognize some of the names that are on this um, webinar, and some of the organizations that are represented, please feel free to send them our way. We're happy to share them with you. Um, and I know that Judith had mentioned this, and, and I know too, just firsthand from working in the autism community for as long as I had, um, how trying this is. Um, I'm not a parent, but I've worked in this field for a very long time and in multiple different capacities. And uh, I, I can tell you from a provider standpoint that your providers and, and individuals who worked with your children and adults that are on the spectrum for autistic, really do miss you. <laughs> this is hard on them too, and we know it's hard on, on parents because it's especially hard that parents are uh, dealing with routine disruption and schedule changes and um, you know services being disrupted, but then also wearing the hats as those therapists and teachers, but also trying to work in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, and, and, and taking on those different roles, and we know that's really hard. We also know that we receive a lot of different phone calls and a lot of different questions from autistic adults who have been impacted by COVID-19, many of whom have a disruption in their service streams, who are losing their, their jobs because of COVID. Um, and so what we have done was really put a compilation of resources together. Uh, and, we're, and this is really 
growing and changing every day because we're learning more and more about that, about how this pandemic really does affect our communities in a lot of different ways. So this is really ongoing and you will see uh, the resources that we have that are available for this community. And I really um, saw a quote on social media that said, you know, we're, we're weathering the storm together. We're, we're not all in the same boat because everybody's boat looks very different, but we're all weathering this storm. And while we would love to say we can provide every single answer to every single question, we know that that's not true. But we also know that we are working very closely with other organizations as well as just internally at Autism Speak to make sure that we're here for you um, in any capacity that we possibly can be. Um, next slide, Judith. So you guys have seen this slide before. It's not an accident that it's in there again. Uh, we really want to reiterate how important this team of people, and we're lucky right now to have two autism response team associates on the phone with us here on the webinar. Um, one of them is based in the great state of Ohio. We have a local contact there as well. Um, but ART stands for our autism response team. We have two free toll-free um, toll numbers and one specifically dedicated to our Spanish-speaking families. And we also know that a lot of times phone conversations can be difficult for individuals. So we also have a dedicated email line. And that's help at autismspeaks.org. Um, this, I work very closely with this group of, of men and women, and I will tell you that they are absolutely amazing. Uh, they do, as Judith said, have some sort of connection to autism, personal and or professional. And uh, we're just very, very fortunate to have them here, especially during this time. We've seen an increase in um, calls and contacts to the autism response team during this time because we know that the need in our community really is just so great. And there's so many different things that we can try to do and resources that we can try to provide um, or point people towards where those resources might be because we know that parents and also professionals and autistic adults themselves are looking for resources and sometimes don't know where to start. And so this is a great opportunity to contact our autism response team and have them help you do those things so you don't have to go seeking for those things on your own. Um, it just kind of takes some of that away from that piece of, of being overwhelmed by what's already going on with us um, in, in this pandemic. So I encourage you to call them. We also have a chat uh, feature on our website where you can start a chat with one of our autism response team associates, uh, and which is also really helpful too. Um, but I, I just can't speak highly enough of them, so please reach out if you need anything. Available nine to five. Um, Eastern Standard Time. So um, I, I wish we could list all the resources that we have around COVID-19, but we would be here for another hour talking about it. So I just encourage you when you go to autismspeaks.org, the very um, top of our page, you will see a, a yellow or gold banner that will, if you click on it, take you to all these different resources. And a couple of them are mentioned here of dealing with school closures. We know that that's been really, really challenging for our community, um, for students on the spectrum who are going to school programs. Um, and again, if you click on this, a bunch of different resources will open up. How do we handle um, clinical care right now? Because we know that's being disrupted and social um, programs and school programs are creating um, a, a huge issue and a lot of those things are being done through telelearning. Um, some of them are not. So there's a bunch of resources under there. And then also just what should the, the autism community know about during the coronavirus outbreak. On this particular page, it's really broken into sections. And so you'll see families as a tab, you'll see adults on the spectrum as a tab, you'll see educators and health uh, professionals, events that are being held. And so if you guys have events, and I've seen some in the chat box, um, please forward those to us and we can add them in here. And then there's also non-English resources. And again, I just want to reiterate how this is an ever-changing situation. And so we are welcoming anybody to share resources, especially local resources that you have, and to join our um, social media local campaigns. So we have Autism Speaks Facebook groups that are specific to your area. And if you reach out to the administrator of those pages and you guys have great information and resources to please share out with us because we can't do this all by ourselves. I just got an uh, email today already about... Um, a, a, a social guide or a story, social story or a story guide uh, about what's happening in our communities this week um, with what's ha happening with um, the latest news. And so there are people who are just making these resources and creating these resources specifically for our community. 
and it's really nice to know that we can lean on each other at this time and, and really just share out each other's resources. So please, I encourage you to continue to do that. And if you haven't already done so, to join your local um, Facebook and Instagram uh, in Ohio. So if you go to autismspeaks.org, actually this is the front facing page and we've kind of un really reshaped this the past couple of years, uh, really about the last year and a half. It looks a little bit different if you haven't visited it recently. Um, but the nice thing about how it's structured now is you can go in and search information by topic. Uh, and we have a lot of information. So if you go to one of the tabs at the bottom, you will see that there's, again, if you click on one tab, a bunch of different resources will open up underneath it. So we have financial planning, we have safety information, which we know is increasingly important during this time. There's information about school and school-aged children. There's technology, uh, health and wellness, behavioral challenges, which we know we're seeing a, an increase of in, in a lot of um, capacities because of the changes in our, in our loved ones' routines. Medical resources, we have wonderful transition to resources, uh, adult resources and adult resources as well. Uh, family support, community life, and then there's a lot of different things listed under miscellaneous. If you're looking for something specific and you cannot find it here, please reach out to the Autism Response Team because they will immediately send you whatever you're looking for if it's available in your area, which is another great way to utilize them. Because we know a lot of times people don't have the time to just go looking for something, um, which is why they serve that really important role as well. Um, so I want to thank you guys so much for participating. I know we have uh, we're really close to the top of the hour, but if we have any questions uh, around any of the resources that I told you about, uh, again, I can spend hours looking at all these different resources and again, we're adding to them every day and as the situation is changing. So um, just we know that you are all very busy and have a lot going on in your lives and um, we just want you to, to, I would like to say thank you personally for participating and also just to uh, really tell you um, how much we are here to support you and we appreciate whether you're a self-advocate on the line, a parent, a professional, it looks like we have a combination of all of you, uh, how much we appreciate what you do in our communities and just please stay safe and be well and I'll turn it back over to Judith to, to bring us home. All right, thank you all so much. As Colleen said, as Dave said, as Patty said, for being with us today. We want to continue to provide good information to you, and we want to continue to hear from you. So please do stay in touch. Check your email inboxes um, later today or tomorrow, and you'll have access to all the information that we shared with you today. Um, thank you again for taking time to join, and we will be in touch very soon. Please be safe, be well, and just know that you're not alone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>